Good afternoon, very late afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicola De Lunto, and uh, um, I work at the Institute of Archaeology and Ancient History at Lund University, and I'm currently uh, coordinating the scientific activities of the Dark Lab, the Digital Archaeology Lab, which we have at Lund. Uh, we work a lot with we're very much interest in understanding how visualization is changing our way of perceiving uh, archaeological information, and we're very much interested in archaeological results. So what, what we do is really focus in answering research questions more than, let's say, developing and so on. Um, but today I would like to you know, divide the presentation in two small parts. The first one is about 3D models. I mean, what, what, what are these entities and how those should be considered in, in relation of what we, uh, what we search or what we document. And another one is about some case studies which display some you know, of our results of consideration and so on. So we know that you know, 3D model can be defined in many different ways. And a definition I like is a, word, is a summary or simplification of a physical thing. Uh, but the reality is that we have very different typology of 3D models. And, and very often, the idea is that those can be substitute drawings. Or, but this is not true. I mean, uh, uh, every typology of data has its own uh, affordance, I would say, or uh, properties. And we think that all of those can really um, help us um, in documenting and highlighting specific aspects of it. Um, this is interesting. This is a, a slide which displays a case study, very old case study in, in uh, 2012. We were out in a field and in basically half a day we were able, just using image-based modeling, scanning of producing a huge amount of 3D models of different type of uh, archaeological evidence retrieved during the excavations. And the first thing we figured it out was that, well, this is too much. I mean, this is really, this morning, I think, uh, you, there was a presentation talking about big data. These are big data and complex data. So there is really uh, complexity also because they don't, um, um, they are not designed actually to fit our normal traditional visualization system. So in order to make something good with those, we need to, I think, uh, challenge our paradigms or how we use information. Um, we have been experiencing a lot with 3D GIS platforms, um, but there are many different topology platforms which you know, help you out in, in using this data. There is Blender, the augmented metrics, for example, with the Metrescu. We have uh, uh, someone used Unity. And uh, you know, all these platforms, they actually resemble very different characteristics. Of course, the 3D model, when it's actually visualized, into, for example, into a 3D GIS, allow you to as an archaeologist to use the model and running a huge number of operations, which would have been impossible to do in any other way. We decided to go for 3D GIS because it allowed to use our models in relation of uh, more traditional documentation, which very often is everything is left on a site. Like for example, in Pompeii, we have a lot of very good documentation which has been scanned and you know, we need that in relation of our, of our models and so on. But still, it's not really the, the, the only solution. There are many, many. Um, you can, I mean, compare drawings, uh, you can run statistics, uh, you can make measurements which are difficult to perform in the field in any other way. But most important, they don't really substitute your work in the field. They actually implement your work in the field. I mean, you use that in a tablet, for example, and you can get a huge amount of information. But visualization and 3D model are not the problems, really. I mean, are only one part of the facade. There's been a huge discussion about, oh, we should you should develop a different database. This is the best database. This is the best visualization system. You should change. This is not sufficiently enough for the standard. Well, but the reality is that for our experience, we have been trying this in many, many different archaeological excavations, really using a, a combination of GIS and 3D models in different situations, which goes from building archaeology, classical archaeology, to uh, prehistory and so on. And you know, the, 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 the final consideration is that you need to adapt. There is no a system which fit for everything. And you know, we, we've been finding ourselves in customizing our database or our you know, way of moving in the field or really catching the information in a, in a way that you know, in other case studies didn't, didn't work so well. So it's interesting because with technology, we have flexibility, something that you know, it, was, it doesn't really fit well with the standardization of data. So, and uh, <coughs> for example, in this case, this is the case of uh, um, uh, Schemping eh? is an excavation which we have, we have been recording this for four years excavation completely in 3D. We only use 3D models or 3D surface models. As a palimpsest, we're recording in 3D our information. 
the database was customized in order to, you know, uh, uh, host the information from the excavation. And most important, what was interesting is that this site, for example, was very special for the artifacts, and because the con many of the contexts actually were disturbed, so we didn't have so many specialists in lithics artifacts in the field. And you will know, you know, usually you have one, if you're lucky, one or two in the field excavating. Otherwise, you usually you analyze them once back. But in that case, we could produce actually uh, reference collections for the students or for archaeologists working on site and actually eventually having given the possibility of better understanding the artifacts or you know what were they encountering during the excavation directly in the field. Um, this topology of approach it's very much interpretative in many senses. Uh, for example, when creating the model, you analyze the context, you make a 3D. The 3D acquisition is actually subjective per se. The way of how you take the picture, which kind of light you decide to use, the way of how you move if you're using a scanner, how many scans you're taking, this is definitely a choice of the operator. So subjectivity is not a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing if you know how to do it. So that's also the big risk, having a model with a couple of click. It's not the same. The majority of these models are really not, not really good because they don't display the research question um, of the single researcher. But if you know the way where you're using it, what you can obtain from them, the results are great. The 3 dgs implementation, when it's in the field, is not a matter of interpretation, I would say. Eventually, it's happened before. But then also the 3D drawing, when we 3D draw on the models for highlighting what we think should be uh, you know, uh, highlighted in, in, uh, uh, in the context, the context description is also part of the way of actually archaeologists uh, uh, perform their operation in the field. And this change all the time, in a sense, and very often reflect the research questions. Um, this is really the core, or my point. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that focusing the discussion on databases, tool for analysis, oh, I'm using the better instruments and acquisition methods, is, is not going to work. Because the reality is that all these things are, are completely connected. I mean, the kind of instruments you're going to use are going to define the typology of model you're going to make for actually being visualized in the type of system you have at that moment. Because this is how it is. So it's very interesting, the fact that this is very fluid, it's dynamic. And I was really, I think, you know, there is no standardization that we can look into it. And I don't think it's actually the real direction to take. Because standardization very often kills what is the creativity of, of the research process. I think a good conclusion was uh, in a very interesting edited volume from uh, Eder Risetto and Fabrizio Galeazzi, when they, uh, basically in the introduction of this, they, they conclude that, well, instead of going for standardization of software, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Eder, uh, uh, actually the, 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 the idea of creating output or standard which can be shared is a much better solution. Is it very wise? Because actually allow us to be flexible and do what we need at the moment to do it. So. Um, so this is, this is very important. This is what we, when it's about stratigraphy, how do you document your stratigraphy? How do you, you go through the excavation? Well, it depends on what actually you have and what you want to achieve. But actually this goes very much behind uh, these possibilities. We've been ex experiencing a lot also with volumes. Uh, well, another thing that, that I would like to, to uh, share with you, oops, I don't know. Um, is the fact that we tend to think when it's about 3D models that, well, you know, it's like a linear evolution, no? like a human evolution, like a point, a polygon, a polyline, a bounder bond model, a surface model, a volumetric model, like if one is the evolution of the others. I believe this is not absolutely true. There are actually things which you can do with volumes, uh, which you cannot do with surface model and vice versa. We should think that actually the volumes are very much of an infer, actually, conclusion. So you never see it. When you excavate, you have spoiled, actually, the, the excavation. And, and um, I've seen a very interesting paper of Peter Jensen about that, that you go, you create a stratigraphy going layer by layer, but it still is, you know, is a, is a, is a different approach, it's a surface approach. The only technology which they give us the possibility of visualizing volumes for a direct acquisition tool is geophysics. And this actually can be definitely visualized as a points cloud and volumes in the GIS. And it's fantastic because they come with intensity values. So, but all the others are unfair, actually, which is not bad at all, but you should not, you know, you should, you should take into account of that limitation in a sense. 
as well as you know surface models as well they have the same uh, characteristic of, of polygons so it's more about the affordance of the models which make the difference and not the type of model per se this is a fantastic case we we we, we this was actually a sort of this is sort of for is a is a, a prehistoric cave which was excavated in the 19th century uh, with with split layers so no stratigraphy but it was fantastic because um, by scanning basically the, the, the cave and using the documentation of the split layers from the archaeologists at that time, it was possible to reconstruct the volumes of it in many small sub-volumes. And then by filling the database of the volumes with the, with the artifacts found, and actually I think now in Stockholm, part of them, it was possible to re-simulate a stratigraphic sequence in the cave. So it was extremely interesting to show you, to, to show how technology and the combination of these things can really allow you to reopen cases which before were considered completely closed. And it's not only about flat volumes. It's not about volumes of what, what, what was lost or what you can see. Volumes allow also to map space which is intangible. And most important, we, we, use, we use very much a technique based on vector volumes. Um, there is a motive behind of it because the majority of acquisition techniques like laser scanning, for example, or image-based modeling, they come out with a point cloud. And the point cloud is very light to be visualized. So it was, if you transform actually that point uh, in, in a small cube, uh, basically what you do, you are, you are adding a volumetric volume of everything is in the specific space. And it's interesting because it allows you to, for example, making uh, visual scape analysis in a completely different way. I mean, measuring what is actually not material, what is in the, in the interspace, where people were moving, the people were living. Uh, this is, by the way, is a fantastic work of, of, one, of one of our students uh, Victor Lundstrom, uh, and we made an excavation and, and calculation of visibility with it. So it's, it's extremely interesting, the potentials which open behind the traditional methods. So how do you stratigraph? What is the stratigraphy in this? Where it is? So it's extremely interesting to expand a little bit the concept of stratigraphy, I would say, and, and thinking a little bit, let me say, out of the box. Um, now we'll present some case study, and I want to present some also, no limitation, but something that we have to taking into account when we, we designed this. Uh, I'm very happy of the presentation before uh, about there was a mention of Chateau-Luc and, and stratigraphy because this fit, fit very well. However, Chateau-Luc, you have usually 100 or 150, how many, archaeologists working in the field and acquiring a lot of context about it. I mean, you cannot really make a 3D model for each context. It's, we tried, huh? but it was not really easy to manage. So you need to find compromises. And compromises, of course, mean that you you know, you say no to some things, but if you're very clear what you want to achieve with it, it is extremely interesting. So we start actually only acquiring or making a 3D model in that case when we have basically um, a, a, a building which was in face, a building which was a feature or a space. Um, it was extremely interesting because uh, 2015, this feature, which now is very visible, but it was not, it came out from one of the walls, which by the way, you know, in a, in a feature, things is basically usually documented by two contexts, right? Bricks and murder. So, and when this, which was not visible actually in, in the wall, went to the conservation lab, it came out to be uh, it F666, I think, the beast. It was, is an obsidian, is a beautiful artifact, it's obsidian eyes. And the big question is where it was looking at. One of our colleagues, she found actually the feature in one of the old models. What was the problem? The problem was that this feature was covered, it was plastered, so we didn't see the eyes. So by making a 3D model of it and realigning the, the, the restored uh, feature we need, it was actually possible to, uh, by looking at the line of sight, re actually, by looking at the line of sight, it came out a niche, and also another part of this small monument in the house was recognized after all. So you see how this allow you to go back in time and recomposing like a puzzle of this and reinterpreting or interpreting this in a completely different way. It's no longer linear at all. Um, this is another very fun case study. I, I was involved in a uh, Sambibori, it's a ring fort in Holland, and this was a, a, an excavation um, managed by the Karl Marcanti Museums and Lund University had the participation of it, and it was a cold case. Basically it was an homicide in an Iron Age, and was interesting because due to a little to a loo thing, a small excavation was done, C A B, and you know, uh, however, it came out a body 
and a piece of another body. So basically, the material was removed, 3D model was done, and the year after, a larger excavation was removed. Everything was georeferenced, everything was in the, in the context, so it was extremely interesting to basically being in the field or having the excavation in your, in your hands and just drag and drop from the geodatabase the models which were merging. So it was possible basically to recreate, uh, you see, to manage in 3D entirely the scene. I think this is already a result, but it was not the result of this paper. Uh, at that time, we, we was working with a colleague of mine. She, uh, she was doing a PhD at LNDL, so now she's, she doctorated a couple of years ago. Uh, she's an osteologist. So we say, why don't we combine all this? Why don't we work together on this? So, and, and it was extremely interesting because she, I mean, together we customized the database in order to actually host the information from osteology. And what she did, instead of um, when she was analyzing bone by bone in Lund, she was recording in 3D directly on the bones the, the, the typology of, 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 prob of the osteological analysis, of fractures or whatever. And by just querying the system and saying, show me all the uh, fracture post-mortem, it just came out this, which is a pattern, meaning probably the roof collapsing on the bodies and cracking the bones. This was interesting, why? Because if you look at experimental archaeology, if the building would have been left there, the, the tiles would have been falling like that, not creating this pattern. So it was telling us that actually it was collapsed in the very same moment or immediately after they died. The bones would have been spread out. And so this was also, by the way, giving information about, I would say, the roof and the house. So it's extremely interesting, the fact that this information was not possible to identify, it was not impossible to identify neither in the field or in the lab. And this is important, especially with the first presentation about, you know, in a microscopic way, how much we can see is true. Another question is, and which kind of environment will allow me to see this? Because it's not only a limitation of our eyes in detecting or not an information, but it's also the limitation of our mind in putting together the piece and the identifying the patterns. Um, and it's great because actually uh, we're now collaborating with the forensic police. Uh, the Swedish forensic police um, is, was very interesting in this technique. And uh, they probably got the paper, so we. We, now we, we pull up a project together in the national um, grant infrastructure, and uh, we are having a lot of meetings because we think we can learn a lot from each other, and they have a lot of you know things or approaches which could be int interesting for us. So this is very important because it shows how you know thinking out of the box or trying to um, make something different or challenging the paradigms allow you eventually to be to to have a actually strong impact also in the society, and by the way, receiving from the society an interesting impact. Um, this is the last slide. I'm very proud because it's only 18 minutes. Um, it's to summarize, not the problem, but the situation. Really going through that, I designed the best software of 3D visualization ever, or you should not use that, you should not use that, or oh, the, the database is, it's, uh, you know, should be done only for these and only for us. <sighs> Yes and no. I mean, this is absolutely true. We need to implement tools. I absolutely agree with it. But we also need to take account that it's not the tool per se. It's also the way of how we combine all these tools for answering, for answering the research questions. When we work in Pompeii, for example, the database, the visualization system and everything was done to answer questions which are typical of Pompeii analysis. When we were working at Chadaloyuk, it was completely different. I mean, same tools, same archaeologists, in a sense, but very, very different. So the point is, let's keep being flexible. And, and because this is actually flexibility, I think is the key word with the new upcoming technologies. And will give us the possibility of doing so much more than what has been just done. So thank you so much. <laughs>